Hello everyone, so today I had something pretty cool I wanted to show you, wanted to share with you all. It's based on something a developer was tweeting about a while ago now that caught my attention, but also uh, I guess my budding enthusiasm for the preservation of old video game assets and looking into the past. So. Bear with me, you'll remember about a month ago, a month and a half ago, uh, I produced a video in which we remastered, we built up, we remade the original Prophecy CGI cinematic trailer to uh, make it look a bit better for contemporary times. That was an awful lot of fun, and off of the back of that, uh, I actually have found a fair few different interesting things. Uh, I spent an evening on the Guild Wars original FTP server, which is still up and you can get into, uh, revealing all kinds of old trailers, footage from the end of the original Prophecy. Prophecies beta, uh, an old trading card set. Look at this. Look at these Guild Wars trading cards. Apparently, this was like a sealed deck style format thing they used to play at conventions. Just a load of really, really cool stuff. Um, but so I've been really into this, and uh, a certain tweet from a very certain de developer, Matthew Medina, caught my eye on Twitter just a little while ago where he posted some maps. Alright, so as you guys know, my other big enthusiasm is the lore, and it is the world. And what Matthew showed was really quite fascinating to me. They were early work in progress, non-canon, but initial ideas and designs for what Tyria would look like. Now, you've got to understand me here, guys. I've been playing, I've been doing this franchise for a long time. To me, Tyria is Tyria, and it's really interesting to think of the different directions that they might have gone in, and to see what they were originally playing with. So in this video, I want to show you guys that but I thought I'd go one further as well and to bring you all into the loop To just really understand the gravity of this and how cool I think it is I thought we'd turn it into a little something else. I'm gonna show you through the ages every map and iteration we have had of Tyria Going backwards working to the point of Matthew's tweet. So if you're a lame wad there is an annotation on screen so you can click to those maps if you really want to, but bear with me. I think I've got some cool stuff that I can show off to you guys as well. Let's take a step back in time as to what we actually understand Tyria to be and uh, see how these maps all work out. Alright, so I guess the most recent map, um, obviously we're in the Heart of Thorns expansion right now, the most... Um, up to date time that the developers have sincerely like updated the world map and I mean beyond stuff like adding uh, Bitter Frost Frontier or Ember Bay which you can see on screen right now. Before these, uh, in Heart of Thorns they did actually, and this is quite easy to miss, uh, do a little something with the guild halls. Uh, guild halls do have that portal system in there which no one really uses and I'm hoping to discuss with you at a later date. But the portal itself does, if you look quite closely once you've got the upgrade, have a little depiction of the globe Tyria. And so this is pretty cool. They have done that before in the past, but that is Tyria as a globe right there. And you can sort of see that spin around. So that's the most recent one. It's really not that fun. Uh, rewinding a little bit, let's have a look at Guild Wars 2 main, okay, or Living World. This is the Guild Wars 2 world map that we currently know. This is what we all know. This is what we love. This is what we get when we press M and um, we are looking to see where we want to waypoint around the world with the most recent addition, of course, of Bitter Frost Frontier up at the very north of Frost Gorge Sound. The wiki is actually slightly out of date with this. They haven't uh, even got Ember Bay on there or maybe even Bloodstone Fen, but this is the most recent world map. Not too interesting. I will note that we had some other... Um Cool maps coming out in the mists too. So this is the map of the mists as us the players, not the lore item. I'm not going to be talking about that here. But this is what the map we get when we're in the PvP lobby. This represents the world versus world battlegrounds. And every time they add a new PvP map, like Eternal Coliseum or whatever, they actually get added onto this too. And you'll notice it's a fairly big map. This is sort of our competitive environment. These are the two main maps that we end up playing around with. But so to dive a little bit more into launch, there was something else very cool that happened and many Order of Whispers players uh, will be more than familiar with this. We actually did get uh, a globe of Tyria for the first time back in 2012. So this globe we saw with Heart of Thorns, that's really just a new version of this. So this here is the giant map of the world that the uh, Order of Whispers, this intelligent organization, uh, seems to have. And they even seem to be trying to map out ley lines or something on their big artifact here. But this Globe of Whispers is our very first, in 2012, perspective for all of the game. So for those out of the loop or don't know why this is interesting, okay? Before this, this thing here 
We didn't know how big the world was. We knew that we'd been to various continents. We knew we'd been to Cantha and we'd been to Alona and we'd been to uh, Tyria that we're currently on. But how big was Tyria compared to the wider world? What's to the right of Tyria? What's to the north of Tyria, to the south? We never knew any of those answers until this big globe here. And there was a very rudimentary, very low res texture plastered over it. Uh, way back in one of the betas, uh, that shaman actually data mined it out, pulled it out. I was making videos at the time and I said, oh, some guy did this thing called data mining, guys. I'm not quite sure how it works, blah, blah, blah. Not knowing that I was talking about one of the very first mines that ever happened that shaman ever did. Shaman also went on, if you look on screen now, to um, create these cool little renders of his own of what Tyria might look like. Uh, and generally this was a really fantastic moment. We didn't know whether the devs were ever going to stick with what we see on this map. Hell, we still don't know, but this revealed the existence of several other islands way beyond the borders of the current world map, and we've done a ton of speculation about it before. There's a link on screen if you want to check out the first time I was really geeking out at this. The reason, though, I'm talking about this a bit more today is since 2012, we also had Living World, and in Living World Season 2, the devs brought this texture back. See, in the Dermond Priory Special Archives on the floor, there was a carpet that was showing, yes, this same thing again. So not in globe form, but we got to see this as a map. And on top of that, in this Season 2 update, one of the best updates they've ever done for the game, there was text there too. So now the devs had even labelled some of these areas, and we had distant places that uh, could perhaps still be incorrectly translated. I'm not sure. Some of the developer names might be on the list. Uh, there's a place that seems to be called Dawn. There's a place called Misandry. Uh, there's all kinds of really interesting stuff that you guys, I seriously do encourage to check out. And um, so with that in Season 2, it certainly feels like maybe the devs really do believe this is the whole world now and these islands miles away one day we will get to go to perhaps not in this game maybe in another game set in the same ip it doesn't really matter but that is Tyrion. we have a real perspective now and you can do fun maths to figure out how big the world is compared to the real world and it ends up being really small but still um it, it's been pretty awesome so those are the main maps that we've had uh since guild wars 2's been out so now Let's start stepping back into the hazy past. And the further into the past we go, the less canonical a lot of this stuff will be. So, what came just before the release of Guild Wars 2? Well, we had the betas. And some of you guys might not remember or might not realize this, but this image here, which I've got from the betas, uh, the map was actually different. This is a different world map. The artistry on it is slightly different, particularly look at areas like Timberline Falls. The colouring is slightly different. Back then, I think that they were dealing with the different layers, you know, seeing the surface world, the lower world, and, and the higher world. Uh, they were treating that different artistically. But what's more interesting, perhaps, is actually the uh, naming of the various regions. There are some differences there. Most notably, you'll see the Ancient Dwarf Lands, down at what we now call the Delgamore Front, and also the absence of a lot of other place names uh, that did come in for the launch of the game, but back during the betas, uh, we had uh, we had no idea of. So like the Scavengers Causeway doesn't exist on this map, right? But the Ancient Dwarf Lands does. So whether we should still call the Delgamore Front the Ancient Dwarf Lands, I'm not really sure since it never made it into the proper game. But if you look quite high up as well, there's also a place called the Verdant Forest, which I believe also has a different name these days. So a uh, slightly different map in the betas. Some of you guys might remember it. More of just a, a little bit of trivia perhaps on that one. Let's go back a little bit further though. Okay, so those are the betas. That's what most of us played. In fact, I think that was only the press beta. That was what only very few members of the press got to see. The real betas, I think they changed it already. But let's go back a little bit further. Let's go to the alphas. And let's go to the conventions. So there's quite a lot I could show you here. I won't go the whole hog. But yeah, uh, back in uh, 2010 now, around here, when they were first revealing the game, people could go to places like Gamescom, to PAX, which is right on their doorstep over there in Seattle, or Bellevue as they are. And uh, what they could do then is get access to very early versions of Guild Wars 2, mainly very limited maps. So the first ever alpha showed Queensdale, Divinity's Reach, and Blaze Ridge Steps. That was it. And then later they added Gendarren, and then later, slowly, a few more things filled in. There was a French demo that got a new place at one point. This was a long time ago. This was back when the 
trait system was like Final Fantasy materia. And this was when we had skill books. And this was when we had attributes we'd slot in as we leveled up. And energy potions and all these changes. So what was the world map like that then back then? It was totally different. It looked like this. So this is the most zoomed out version of the map. This has actually been retouched. This is a really classy, fancy version of it, actually, um, uh, where multiple different ones have been combined. So you'll see these little icons in the middle. These are actually representing the cities. Uh, so you've got that light, very nautical looking lines arch one in the middle. And then you've got the Black Citadel. You've got Holbrack, DR, and then down over at the Tarnished uh, Coast, you've got Ratasum and the Grove. These icons representing the cities, I don't think appear anywhere anymore, but they're actually really beautiful and I really do quite uh, like them. So this map was the big one that you'd have pulled out mostly, but it would unfog as you were in individual areas. And so we've seen unfogged versions from crappy shaky cams of Blaze Ridge Steps, of uh, Queensdale. You could see the old waypoint design where there were very few waypoints. There's even a very special filter they used to put on it when you went underwater that doesn't exist in game anymore. Um, but uh, we'll have a look here. This is Divinity's Reach. This is a more zoomed in one. This is kind of what you would expect, right? This is the different style of waypoints. This is, of course, Divinity's Reach with the Great Collapse. Two things of note that I really enjoy about this, okay, is uh, if you look to the very north, you'll see above the Plaza of Grenth some suggestion that there's a pathway out of the city to the north, a bridge to the north, and that's of course a hint to the now uh, cut these days map Lake Doric. I've done a lot of talk about recently on the channel, uh, but also what's really interesting is to the south. To the south is another cut area that I've always been really keen on. I always feel like if they ever remade the personal story and they did the commoner version of it, it, all the personal story steps could take place there. But there was once upon a time a waterfront district to Divinity's Reach. As you can see down there, uh, very, very, very subtly on this map, there are better versions of it out there. But this now, if you look at that in Guild Wars 2 of today, that's just a cluster of random houses that you skip over that they've written out. But once upon a time, they did have an idea for a waterfront style district, uh, but you could never explore it. It was never playable space. It only existed on the map, but I do think that was uh, pretty cool. So, uh, so yeah, those are the alpha maps. I think the alpha maps are pretty interesting, to be honest, out of all of them. Uh, they're some of the cooler ones to have a little bit of a look at. Uh, around this time as well, with the conventions, I remember one specific convention. The developers did actually pull some players into a room to design their own dynamic events. And there was a little bit of uh, information that came out of this. If you look at this map here, this is a very early work in progress developer version of a Guild Wars 2 map. I think we're looking at Harathi Hinterlands here uh, that maps out a bunch of different dynamic events. I believe this was shown to the people in that room so that they could uh, then pick and make their own event. Uh, so this is one. This is Harathi. Uh, another one was Fireheart Rise, as you can see here. And I think that Lornar's Pass was done too. I remember seeing one that referenced the Stone Summit and freaking out way back in the day because the idea that the dwarves were still around was very interesting to us. Um, but yeah, so these were some other really, really early maps. We're getting into the hazy times of Guild Wars 2 now uh, where we got to have a little bit of a look and a bit of a speculation about exactly what was going on. I think anyway, I'm pretty sure that these are those, those maps. Unless they're post-release maps that people have just sort of fiddled around with. Okay, so, uh, so that's kind of the very early days of Guild Wars 2. So where do we go now? Well, you might think Guild Wars 1, but there is some stuff in the interim. There is, of course, the Guild Wars 2 Collector's Edition case. Yep, which is another interpretation of the world map. I think it's the same texture. I think it's the same looking thing. But obviously, uh, if you guys never bought one of these, I've got one just behind me. It's... Um kind of a bumpy metal, like they press the metal out in different places, so the mountains, it comes out a lot higher at the water, it's that very smooth, flat black. So uh, we have that. Then also just before that, we had the books. So uh, I just snapped this picture of Edge of Destiny in my hand a second ago before uh, recording this video. This was actually a pretty interesting map when it first came out. Um, I remember when the books first released and we were looking at this on the forums, it almost looked totally unrecognizable to me as the world when I was thinking of the Guild Wars 1 world maps. But it does actually overlay and line up very, very closely to the Guild Wars 1 maps. Of course, all, this was the first time we saw what all looked like when it had been uh, brought back out from beneath the depths. 
Um, we saw the place of the, the location, sorry, of the Dermond Priory and uh, the Northern Wall looking very prominent on there as well. The Dominion of Winds has its border there and it seems to be that this was written at a time where maybe they were going to have the Tengu be developed. You'll also notice uh, a lot of squares on here representing dungeons like Ascalon Catacombs and Arab. But then also uh, there is the Ruins of Denravi on there marked as a dungeon. And there is Bloodstone Fen marked on there as a dungeon and uh we've talked about this before even more interesting too is the kind of like semi-cut region of steam spur mountains so in these early concepts for guild wars 2 I think that the developers appreciated that there's a lot of mountains, right? There's a lot of, you've got the northern Shiver Peaks, you've got the southern Shiver Peaks, you've got the far Shiver Peaks. I think what they were trying to do was have the most southern of the mountains feel different aesthetically to, say, where the Norn was starting around Holbrek. And they had an idea for these being the steam spur mountains, perhaps lots of volcanoes, lots of geothermal activity. And on this map, you can see quite prominently there's areas there called Steam Spur Bay. Uh, we know now that Mount Maelstrom didn't end up anything like that. It really is just looking a bit more like Maguma jungle territory and they never went the whole hog with it. So I'm curious what they'll do with that uh, and even like the Zephyrite area we eventually got in the Living Worlds uh, Season 1 stuff didn't really play into that too much. So I wonder whether that's totally retconned out but those are some early ideas too. And funnily enough if you look at the Fire Island chain that seems pretty reminiscent of Ember Bay's position which uh, is a weird thing to have had worked out. So yeah that was a, a very 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 exciting map. Um, with the books, of course, you could buy a hard copy or this much cleaner looking one you've probably been looking at for a while here, uh, which you could actually extract from the PDF versions that came out. So uh, that's like maybe a little bit of a pretty version that you guys have been looking at instead of just the real one in my hands. And I think as far as Guild Wars 2 is concerned, that's most of the iterations of the maps that we've seen. So let's go back. All right, let's go into Guild Wars 1. Uh, Guild Wars 1, of course, we had Eye of the North. Eye of the North did expand the map. Um, or sort of. So basically what happened was a couple of months before Eye of the North released, the devs expanded the world map to what you see here. They uh, let us see the Isles of Janthir, they let us see the Verdant Cascades, they let us see north of the lakes above uh, Kryter, and we got a lot more detail, say, about the Char homelands and stuff. So this was the Eye of the North map um, as it had originally came out, but that's not how things had originally looked, as we'll see. Rewind the clock a little bit further, and of course we had the Nightfall expansion. So this is the Nightfall map here. Uh, there is actually another version of this Nightfall map too that marks off a lot of different areas in Nightfall that never ended up existing uh, whatsoever. Uh, I believe the Collector's Edition gives you one of those, but uh, I have actually got an unboxing video that will be on the way at some point where we have a look at that. But this marks off the Ellen River, the Sulphurous Wastes and so forth. These, these are areas we haven't been to in Guild Wars 2 yet. With that came the Realm of Torment, of course, uh, which Guild Wars 2 players might notice looks very recognisable to the the vision we saw in Omad's machine uh, looks very similar to Lord Odrin's map of the mists. Uh, so that was another map that we got in Nightfall. Rewind the clock another six to eight months or so. Uh, we have Canther. So this is the Canthan map. This is super far to the south. This is nowhere near anything we've played in Guild Wars 2. Uh, I believe this is the only iteration we ever had of the Canthan map. Uh, there's a little bit more information off to the side on it. But generally speaking, that's what Canther looks like. Uh, before that, they introduced the Battle Isles. So this is the Battle Isle map. Uh, this is what you would see if you were a big Guild Wars 1 PvP. -er. It's kind of the Guild Wars 1 equivalent of uh, that Mists map that I showed you earlier. Uh, and rewind even further, and we have the original Prophecies map. Okay, so we kind of rushed through those quite quickly. Let's stop here. So let's uh, examine quite closely. Let's look at the art style on this. A lot of Guild Wars 2 players won't recognize this necessarily, but it has kind of this very distinct look to it. Fairly realistic look as well, actually, I would say, especially when you look around Den Ravi and so forth. Uh, but there you've got the Great Northern Wall is marked off. We have Ascalon. The region is called the Ascalon Ruins rather than just Ascalon. The Maguma Jungle, Kryta, Lion's Arch, Drockner's Forge in the Shiver Peaks, which eventually will become 
Steam Spur, the Crystal Desert down there with the Amnun Oasis. Okay, that is what we've got. You'll notice that this doesn't let you see very far to the north. And that's because, again, I of the North was what expanded us to be able to go up there. So these were the main maps from Guild Wars 1. And players kind of did their fan art interpretations like this that you can see here, where they connected all of them together into one seamless large image. And of course, when we got the full globe in Guild Wars 2, that was huge and we could do everything together. But this map here is about as far back in time as I believe I've ever seen. Okay, so for all these years that I've played Guild Wars... This was as far back as it went. If you wiki, if you go to the Guild Wars 1 wiki and you look at world map, this is, you know, the main thing you'll find. You'll see all kinds of different maps that I've shown you in this video. And it's all been fairly set in stone, okay? However, just about, I don't know, what is it, two weeks ago, something like that? Uh, Matthew Medina throws out this tweet. He says, I've been going through a bunch of old files and I found some of my old maps for Guild Wars 1. So this is a man who was helping develop and concept the world from the very outset. I never realized he'd been at the company for that long. He says, Tyria started out as a pair of islands and Ascalon was called Kylo. So I want to show you guys. And then he, he tweeted these two maps to actually get them in, a, in a, like a larger version was a little bit difficult. So he's tweeted out these two maps. Now, I'm, I don't know which one is older. We've been going back in time. So I'm just going to uh, do my best. And I'm guessing that this map of the two images he gave us, this map is the next oldest. Whew. Okay, so what are we looking at here, right, guys? This, this is Ascalon, okay? Or, no, no, sorry, this is the whole world, I guess, at this point. And there's a lot of stuff marked on here that actually does get seen in the rest of the franchise, or as it ended up going forward. So, here, here we go. What we've got uh, to the south, first of all, is the Sea of Sorrows, all right? So if we assume that this is Ascalon, there's a lot of Ascalon landmarks, okay, on this map. The fact that the Sea of Sorrows are to the south is already totally bizarre because we know from the, the the other maps that the Sea of Sorrows is not to the south. The Crystal Desert and so forth is to the south. There is no sea to the south. It's kind of funny that that weirdly lines up with a lore event where once upon a time the Crystal Desert was an ocean and so then Ascalon would have had a coast like we're seeing in this early concept map. But then they wrote in the law that it actually became a desert. I wonder whether that law was made because early concepts of the Guild Wars franchise was that Ascalon had a southern coast. That's really crazy to me. But uh, yeah, so you've got the Sea of Sorrows to the south. It has the same name. They always had that name settled. But obviously, uh, a lot of other things change. You'll notice that it all looks very, very desolate. Now, to go hand in hand with this, um, apparently, another little story that came out was pre-searing Ascalon, uh, this very pretty, vibrant, lovely idea of what Ascalon was like. That was actually only added to Guild Wars very late in the development, specifically because they'd had feedback that it was a bit too grimdark and it was a bit too, you know, depressing at the start of the game. So they wrote in all this stuff about how Ascalon was once upon a time nice and so forth. But you're seeing from this map here, this early map, it looks pretty rough around the edges. It looks like a pretty desolate, pretty horrible place, all right? So uh, you'll notice that they've got a few, like, things marked off, numbers marked off. Um, these presumably would be missions. So this is fairly... Th there's been some history for Guild Wars at the point of this being made, as far as I can speculate, because, as many of you should know, ArenaNet, originally called Triforge, by the way, this was something I learned pretty recently, but ArenaNet, you might think that's a very PvP-sounding name. Well, originally the game that these Blizz ex-Blizzard devs had come off and they wanted to make was a PvP. PvP experience, and that's why it's Guild Wars, and that's what everything was originally based around, but later they decided to add PvE, and I guess this was shortly after that period of time, and they dumped this in, maybe? But so, uh, you'll see that number one is called The Perilous North. So uh, perhaps they had some idea for a mission here where we'd actually go north of the Great Northern Wall very quickly. Kind of similar to what happens in pre-searing where, again, you went north very quickly. I actually wonder whether any of those early pre-searing quests had, were called the Perilous North. Um, the geography here, it looks like there's canyons. There's a massive crack and chasm in the ground. It's not like the tar pits and things that we see in the eventual release. Uh, but so number one was the Perilous North. Uh, also, actually, very similar to uh, the Frontier Gate mission and what we do just after post-searing in, in Guild Wars. Uh, then we're going to go all the way south, as you see, to number two. And this is actually what happens in the story of Prophecies. Uh, we go to Fort Rannick, it seems. And we do a mission called, or a quest called, The Walls of Ascalon. I have no idea what The Walls of Ascalon would be, but isn't that bizarre? Thinking about Fort Rannick being like a coastside fort. 
It's mental. I mean, we did an Elseworld video kind of recently, but Jesus Christ. Um, moving on, uh, we got number three a little bit further. This is called Prisoners of War. And again, that's what the story does for us in the eventual release of the game. We do eventually go north of the wall. We uh, scavenge some old cities up there, the ruins of Sermia. And Sermia appears on this early development map here. Uh, but you go north and you find some prisoners and you rescue them. And so the Prisoners of War seems to line up. And then after that, again, the mission seems to work out because you have Stormcaller here. Mission number four, Stormcaller. And this, uh, this seems to line up with what we did eventually do, which was find the old relic with Prince Rurik and use it to beat the Char back. So a lot of this stuff seems to have been established. But obviously the setting for it is very different. Stormcaller doesn't take us anywhere near south to Rin. This Rin, guys, for those Guild Wars 2 pe only people who are watching this, that's the Black Citadel. That will eventually become the Black Citadel in a really bizarre, crazy way. So a lot of the um, geography and the way that things are lined up here from early, early, early Ascalon does map over and translate into the Ascalon we knew of back in Guild Wars 1 and eventually into Guild Wars 2. But um, a lot of the settings seem very odd as well. Uh, so the Nalani here is marked as a city. Nalani is actually an academy, one of two academies uh, for magic. And uh, again, it's sort of where the Stormcaller mission should have taken us to. So that's consistent. Over here, though, on the right, you'll see there's a place called Kylo. And Kylo is marked in yellow, but doesn't have a number. Okay, so what this is, is this was the original capital of Ascon. Now, the devs have actually, this is a well-known old story. It wasn't revealed just in this tweet. But so, uh, it's been well known for a long time that Ascalon City, as we knew it, because you had the Ascalon and then it, the city, Ascalon City, uh, was actually going to be called Kylo for a long time. And some of the early lore that you could listen to, you'd hear about how Devonna's father died in a guild battle at the town of Kylo. And in Guild Wars 2, Kylo came into the game for real because they turned it into one of the PvP maps. The PvP map with Clock Tower and that, that is the Battle of Kylo that is based on this place you're looking at on the map right now. Okay, this fictional weird area of Ascalon known as Kylo. Um, and so this map is way back uh, before that became known as Ascalon City or why that was renamed eventually. I don't know whether that was a developer faux pas or what, I'm not sure. But, uh, but yeah, so we see Kylo here if you were wondering what that was. You see the Northern Wall broken and damaged. Um, moving north, here's some more interesting stuff, okay? Way up north, we've got a place called the Dragon's Gullet. Which, when you look at this map in, in total, you zoom out, it kind of looks, to go so far north, because that's in the northern reaches of the game, it sort of feels like, yeah, that's the Dragon's Gullet, a big end gamey sounding place. Of course, that didn't really pan out in the eventual release because Tyria ended up so much bigger. This was just one region of many and it wasn't even that far north. So the Dragon's Gullet was always an interesting place to me in Guild Wars 1. It seemed to me that maybe it was dropped into the game way later than a lot of the other places and the, uh, you know, it was a last minute addition. But instead, actually, this map would seem to suggest the Dragon's Gullet map, which really there was very little to do, was always planned. Uh, to the left of it, however, there is something a bit different. An arrow. Uh, I think that's an arrow we're looking at there. And a place called the Frozen North. In fact, does it say to Frozen North? That doesn't say the Frozen North, does it? Or does it say to Frozen North? So is that a suggestion they had plans for other areas to the north? Like you could actually scroll the map or something? Is this almost like a Path of Exile style map system where this is just one chapter and then we'd move up a little bit? I do like these very um, stylized maps that don't really show you your exact position when you're in game. I feel like it uh, adds a lot more to the world building or the potential size of the world instead of what they did in Guild Wars and Guild Wars 2 in the end. But, uh, but yeah, so you've got the Frozen North, which never really became a thing. The Shiver Peaks are there on the left again, flanking the side of this region. To the right, we have the Ruins of Draskir. Uh, which in the lore, again, does exist. Uh, our interpretation of it in Guild Wars 1 uh, at Prophecy's release was you had Sermia and Draskir and they were very close to one another and it was a bit hard to see where the difference between the two was. Well, on this map, it seems very clear what the difference between the two are. And then finally, the last interesting thing is to the top right. So the top right of Ascalon... If anything, it's been the Blood Legion homeland for Guild Wars 2 and Guild Wars 1 players, and there's really not been much to do there ever. But this is called The Wastes, and it even says Tournament up there. 
So in the eventual release, we did have an arena in Ascalon, where it's now called Kylo in the top right-ish, but that's... There was nothing like a tournament, so th is this what some weird hybrid thing where they were going to get all their teaching people for PvP for the tournament? It was all just to feed them there, but it, within this one region. And then the idea of this thing just called the Wastes off into that area of the world uh, has obviously been completely eliminated. So, uh, so yeah, what a fantastic, what an interesting map. That's basically everything I can pick out of it. Uh, I'd love to hear what you guys think. If there's anything that's caught your eye, there is a link directly to the tweet down below. But we're not done. We're not done, okay? That's just this map. So Matthew also linked another map, uh, which was kind of hard to download online, by the way. But he also linked another map. So just before we roll into this, I want to take us back to the Prophecies map. Again, look at the art style of this, okay? Kind of kind of well-defined, kind of distinct. So what was he talking about when he said that it was two islands? Well, maybe this will reveal. Jeez, okay, so this is this is pretty low res, okay? We will start at the south. <laughs> we will start at the south, and we will see what we can do. So, this is the original Tyria, as far as I think. I think this was one of the earliest, earliest, earliest ones. I don't know where this came in the development proce process, but there's uh, enough stuff from that other map we just looked at that did translate eventually that makes me think it was salvage. This entire thing, this all seems to have been scrapped. None of this really made it. But so all the way to the south, we can see like some kind of volcanic island, two islands flanking it. Uh, then we move immediately into like some rainforesty areas. Uh, I I've made a few maps of my own, by the way, and I'm more than familiar with the whole, listen, your rivers should never connect. You know, they always flow from high to low. So I'm like looking at the rivers. I almost thought they made a rookie mistake here, but no. Yeah, so we've got our rivers here, and then we've got some kind of deep, densely forested area off to the side. I wonder whether this was named. And it just keeps going, guys. Then we move into a very frosty place. I mean, this is really bizarre. It's very colourful. It's very fantasy. You've got areas looking a bit like the Fire Island chain on the right. Christ, I know what the geography of this area over here seems to have been. But whatever this was, I think we are, we're like way back in time here. Uh, and then a, a weird island that looks almost like South Sun over on the top right as we move. And, uh, and so that's just one continent. And then if, as we move up again, we have like another continent. And it's like a pure fiery continent. We've got like a moon-based looking island. We've got this interesting kind of formation over here of like... Sh I actually really like this. I think this looks really good. Um, but who knows what would have actually happened here? I mean, I really can't do much more speculation because nothing's marked. But this, guys, this is the original Guild Wars. That's Tyria. The first Tyria. I mean, how mental is that? So that was really interesting to me. All of this stuff is really interesting to me. If you've watched this far into the video, uh, thanks very much. I hope you got a little something out of it. It seems pretty cool. Uh, let me know in the comments if you like this kind of stuff, and I'll be sure to cover more as and when it comes up. But this totally blew my mind. And I don't know, what is YouTube if it's not sharing things that blow your mind? So thanks, guys. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks to Matthews for putting out such a cool tweet. And uh, I hope for more little insights and things like this into the deep past of the game as we go forward. But yeah, guys, there you go. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. And uh, the, their attempts to have this division system and climbing through the divisions in this year hasn't been quite up to snuff. They don't think that people are being placed properly. So they're going for a lot of changes, but before they can really even start to think about that, there's some a more fundamental issue that has to be addressed, and that is the kind of groups that are hitting the queues. So basically, what has been voted on, on a poll, is that for Season 5, we are only able to queue in as a solo queuer or a du duo queuer. One or two players, that is it. You cannot queue in with three people, four people or five people. The entire season will run like that, four ranked, and then they're going to assess what they do in the future. So at first, that might seem really crazy. It might be like, well, why would you do that? You're just cutting away people's ability to be competitive. How has this ended up with an almost 